meditating and retreat, you've got to really open those hips, hips up to sit for that long. You know, if you're sitting 10, 12 hours a day, you've got to be really, really um, well lubed in, in different parts of your body. <laughs> so this is what it'll be. Um, that's what we'll get to. Okay, so Mahamudra. Uh, it's by His Holiness, the first Panchen Lama. Um, and this is uh, it's actually quite famous. It's an auto commentary um, entitled Light of the Crystal Clarity. Uh, in Tibetan, it's Yang Sel Drome. It was translated and taught to us by Lama Christie with the help of Geshe-la. And um, as I said, when I went into retreat, I was given this text and kind of told to go, go for it. And um, kind of like put, toge put it together in a book format uh, for Lama Christi. Um, I gave it to her when I was kind of done with that part of my practice. Uh, and it's funny, even though at a certain point I'm like, okay, I, I'm putting Mahamudra aside, I'm going on to these other things, um, it informed every other thing I did. Somehow everything I did ended up Mahamudra. It's, it was actually really funny. So it's profound, and it's like Ellen Wallace's foundation teachings that I'm telling you, like if you get those, they'll like inform everything else you do. It's the same with Mahamudra. Mm. When I said I was hesitant to teach it, it's because you've kind of got to have a really good understanding of emptiness um, to kind of drive it in the right way, you know? So so there was a part of me like, wow, that's a big responsibility. Mm. You know, like, like someone could take these teachings and um, misinterpret them and then I will have done a disservice to the first Panchen Lama, and he became like my best friend in retreat. I don't want to let him down, <laughs> you know? So, um, is there anyone who, who has never had an emptiness teaching in here? Oh, good. Oh, a couple, okay, good, good, good. Awesome, actually. Um, so I'll start at the basics. And this is like co-classic basic. You don't mess with it. Just like you don't mess with like the Rocky Horror Picture Film. <laughs> there are certain things you just don't mess with. This is one of them. There are not many. <laughs> What's this? <laughs> oh, okay, you could call it a pen. Yeah, I'm not trying to trick you. Yeah, and if a dog comes into the room, what is it to the dog? A chew toy. Thank you for participating. <laughs> a chew toy. Right. So it, it's just a cylinder. It's just a thing. It has no nature of its own. Our minds happen to project a story upon this thing that puts together all the pieces into something we have labeled a pen, we've defined as a pen, which is a definite. What is the definition of a pen? That with which we write, right. So I can take this and I can say, like, hi, you know, and, and it works, right, as a pen. Um, but it can run out of ink, right? Then it wouldn't write anymore. So therefore, it wouldn't have the definition of being a pen anymore. So then was it ever a pen? Or what if I just use it and just, like, use it to clip my hair back? Does it cease to be a pen just because I have a different use for it? You know? It, is it something different because a dog comes in and sees something different? You know? Is he a dog because he sees it differently? Is that the only difference? I don't know. Maybe. But everything's like that, right? Nothing has a true nature. If this had a true nature of being a pen, that with which we write, it would never, ever run out of ink. Every single being would see it as such. It by, doesn't have that by, from its own side. Right? Coke classic. The same is true of your mind. The very same thing is true of your mind. You know? I don't know. Does any of you have a good definition for mind? Clear and knowing. <laughs> Clear and knowing. So if you take a substance uh, like alcohol, do you cease to have a mind? No. 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 
right? So the mind is the same. It has no nature of being clear and knowing from its own side. You know, um, if I cease to be conscious because someone hits, hits me upside the head, do I cease to have a mind? If, if I want to go with a more simple definition and be like, well, no, it's my awareness. I am my awareness. Okay, well, you know, what happens when you fall asleep? You know, do you cease to exist because you are unaware? really quite beautiful you know there there's nothing that that exists from its own side there's nothing that is any one way and therefore like the potential for everything is unimaginable it's just unimaginable so apply that to your mind you know apply it to your mind any conception that you have any idea that you have of what your mind is, not just blow it out of the water <coughs> and just imagine every single object on the entire universe coming from your mind and you're creating it. Every good thing, every bad thing, everything is your mind. You know? I, I love the first Panchen Lama's definition of Mahamudra. And let's see if I can get it here. He says, Mahamudra reaches everywhere. It is the nature of everything. There are no words to describe the indivisible diamond realm of mind. That's a lot, right? <laughs> That's a lot, and we'll unpack it. But, but first I want to just tell you before I jump on, because I've been jumping on a lot here, um, I want to just tell you a little bit about His Holiness, the First Panchen Lama. He's really an amazing, and he was an amazing being. He is in my heart still, so that's why I can speak of him in the present. Uh, I won't tell you his whole biography, but he's known primarily, but what I think of when I think of the First Panchen Lama is a peacemaker the epitome of a peacemaker. He's known for stopping wars, going out in the middle of battlefields and just like somehow just saying the perfect thing and people just put their guns down. Oh, I would love to have that ability, right? Wouldn't that be cool? Um, he's known for uh, he's known for not being attached to his particular uh, sect of Buddhism, you know, like he's really, really cool because, and this, 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 this beautiful text in particular, to me, it exemplifies his peacemaking uh, heart, is because he, what he does with it is he, he presents nine different schools of thought and their particular presentation of Mahamudra. Nobody did that in his time. And are you kidding? Nobody. It was all about, you know, I'll debate you, and if I beat you, then you've got to take on my my form of study and my philosophy, and you've got to drop yours, you know. And he didn't do that. He said, listen, he, he said, how many minds are in this room? And every single one of you will need something different to get you to where you want to go on your path. And if I can present it to you, and if it's not my particular school, who cares? Who cares? I just want you to get there. Isn't that cool? I mean, it was so before his time. It was so before his time. And, and that's what he does in this text, you know? So hopefully that just gives you a little flavor of who he was. And hopefully you'll fall in love with him a little bit uh, <laughs> over the next two days, like I did. Um, uh, just beautiful. So let's talk about his definition now of Mahamudra. What are we doing here? I guess the place to begin with is diamond realm, <coughs> the diamond realm of mind. Let's just 
take the word Mahamudra, and then we'll get to Diamond Realm and Mike very quickly. Uh, it's been defined a million different ways because there's actually a million different practices <laughs> that they call Mahamudra. Um, Maha. What does Maha mean? Great. Great. And Mudra? Seal. seal. Seal is the typical definition. So great seal, right? So we're taught, you know, imagine like a king's ring and he puts his seal on that wax and it, it makes it that thing that, that is official. It makes it, uh, gives it value. But what um, the first Panchen Lama said is he defines mudra as, um, as emptiness. You know, the fact that this thing doesn't have any nature of its own, you know. So now it's like mahamudra means great emptiness, you know. The perception of emptiness, probably. So this is a path to stillness. But it's, if you get to stillness, uh, it's kind of the diving board to, to that great emptiness, um, which overlays everything once you've reached it. And um, I think that's what he means by diamond realm of mind. You know, you can reach a realm where you are so imbued with that particular deep understanding of emptiness that everything you look at is that. And not that. <laughs> You're nothing and everything all at once. You know? um, that's Mahamudra. That's his Mahamudra. Um, I love that definition. Um, so I told you, he, he brings in nine different schools of um, thought. And each of them has a actually very different paths to this Mahamudra. And he, he does this really beautiful thing. He says, okay, well, they look really different, these particular paths. But actually, they're, they're, they've all got like an essence, an essence that's, that's similar, that carries across all the different practices. And um, basically, what that is, is that um, something which tells you to look deep into the nature of your own mind. Every single one of those practices is saying, look at, there's a million different objects you can use to get to emptiness, to get to stillness. But you've got the one you need right in your own head, or you think it's your head, you know, <laughs> you think it's in your head. Mind, you can use your own mind to get there. And it's like totally far out in, in a particular way because um, aren't we trying to get beyond that, right? And isn't mind just another conception? Well, perhaps, but perhaps it's that understanding that if you go after it, the process of going after <coughs> that gets you really, really deep. And let me tell you, once you start doing that on the cushion, like breaking down, uh, the nature of things, and not just the nature of things, but the nature of your own mind, and how it works, and every thought that crosses your mind, and how it passes, and what's in between that thought, and that there's nothing in between that thought, and that that's just a thought too. Um, once you go really deep into that space in between there, um, you see your own mind for the first time. You know, you meet your face, mind to mind. And that's his promise. That's the first Panchen Lama's promise with this text. I mean, and it's a very bold thing to say. Like, I will show you how to meet your mind face to face. I mean, come on, you, 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 you've apparently been living with this your whole life, you know? <laughs> and, and, and what is it? What, what is it? What does it look like? Who's in there? What, what's in there? You know, <laughs> and he's telling you, I'm going to show you. You're going to look in this proverbial mirror and see it and meet it for the first time. And, um, and you can use that to get to your every goal. You don't need another object. He even quotes, he has a quote in there that says, there are llamas in this lineage, in your lineage, 
that say you need look no further for an object than your own mind. You know, use your own mind, and you'll it'll take you where you go. You use it to get to stillness. You use it to get beyond stillness. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, my computer is like jumping all around. <laughs> this is funny. I just want to make sure I don't skip anything because I'm totally just like talking. <laughs> there may be something important to say. <laughs> Let's see. I've done pretty well. <laughs> so then what he does is um, he says, listen, um, you can use your worldview to get into deep states of meditation, or you can use deep states of meditation to drive your worldview, you know, and um, he says, you could go either way. You know, he kind of puts it to you like that. I love him. He must have been from Brooklyn or something. <laughs> <laughs> to me in my head, when I used to talk to him, I used to be like, he used to be like, come on, you know, either one. And um, I, I say that with the highest reverence. Um, <laughs> but like, then he turns around and he reminds us about what the Lama said. He says, you know, you know, no, the Lamas of your our lineage are saying you could use your own mind. So what he's basically saying is like. You do both at the same time. You do both. You know, you you use your worldview to drive your concentration, but you drive your use your concentration to drive your worldview, and that's the upward cycle. You know, and that's why karma is important. You know, the deeper you get into meditation, the more you're like, holy cow! Like every flip of mind is like uh, creating the next thing and creating the next thing. Like I've got to be super careful about even what's crossing my mind and I don't even have control over that, you know? <laughs> so what do I do, you know? And um, when you have the time, when you have the time in retreat or, or if you just even, you know what? You make time in your day, your retreat time, Every day, you know, maybe it's just an hour every day. You can get there, you know. I, I went really far before retreat. And it was because I had a consistent practice. I think that's number one, consistency, by the way. Mm, I don't care if it's 15 minutes. Start there. And that's, but just do it every day at the same time. You know, because guess what? Before you know it, it'll be 20 minutes. Before you know it, it'll be, your mind will want more. It's kind of like yoga. You know, I did yoga for years, and some, and you know what? I didn't do it every day for a long time. But when I started doing it every day, I was like, oh, this is yoga. I didn't know. I've been doing it for five years, and I didn't know what it really was. It's exactly the same thing with meditation. Like, just meet it every day on the cushion, five minutes, 15 minutes, I don't care. Just be there, meet it, meet it, meet it. And that consistency builds. It builds the strength that you need. It builds the resiliency you need. It'll build your world view, and that world view will protect your mind. And guess what? It'll protect the next meditation. Yeah. And, and there, there's no need to be afraid of what crosses your mind. What we need to get good at is just letting it go, letting it keep going, <laughs> rather than grabbing at it. That's the bad thing. You know, that's where the whole emotional balance thing comes in. You know, it's like, how do we learn to just let it keep going? You know, we're all going to have those thoughts, those thoughts of um, wanting to be angry or wanting to be upset about something or jealous or something. Um, we don't have to grab at every emotion that passes our, our mind. That's not us. It's not us, you know. And um, you can get to a place where those things just kind of roll off you, you know. Um, it's pretty 
amazing. It's pretty amazing to to have peace of mind. That's what the first Panchen Lama gave me. That's what my Lamas gave me. Mm. So the first thing he goes through in his text, after, so first thing in his text, he talks about the nine different schools. Then he, he goes through that, after that bit, and then he goes down to the basics. He basically says, okay, so this is how you sit properly in meditation seat. These are the preliminaries. These are the five <coughs> obstacles of meditation. These are the eight antidotes. All the really, really basic things, right? I'm not going to cover them. But it's good for you to remember. I mean, he's bringing them up for a reason. I mean, I don't care how long you've been meditating. Is your cushion the right cushion? You know, you change. <laughs> I mean, I'll third times in retreat. By the, when I started retreat, my, my cushion was pretty filled. And by the end of retreat, just from sitting on it so much, it had gotten really, really down. And um, and I didn't need to fill it up anymore. You know, it kind of grew with me in that way. So check it. You know, if you're if you're having any discomfort, if your knees are hurting you, if anything is hurting that's kicking you out of meditation, please, please, please fix it. Try every different cushion. You ought to be able to sit and not have anything disturb you. I mean, imagine, you know, sitting for four hours undisturbed. Your body's not with you, and there's nothing about it that's going to pull you out. You know, that's the kind of seat you want. That's And that's why it's one of the first things he says. You know, what's your seat? Um, and the preliminaries, all I'm going to say is, I did them every day, a minimum of four times a day in retreat. Um, I'll share this. Like, when I first started meditating, I wasn't Buddhist, you know. Like, I was brought up a good Catholic girl. And uh, so when I started meditating, I used Jesus as my Lama, you know. And, and I loved it, you know. It really worked for me for a long time. And, and then it became Geshe-la, and then it became Lama Christi, and then in retreat, like towards the end of retreat, it was Jesus again. It had gone through this whole cycle. This, it was like this full cycle, and it felt so beautiful to be back in his arms, you know, just like, oh, there was a reason I was born Catholic, you know, and... And so don't feel like you have to hold to one particular image in your preliminaries, you know. Um, use whoever motivates you. Use whoever, who, whose ever energy you need in that particular time. It, it'll change. And that's okay. You know, you're not, you're not letting anyone down by doing that. Um, Some of my most profound experiences in retreat uh, involved Jesus. I was born on an Easter Sunday, so I, I like with, I had this uh, obsession <laughs> with the with the resurrection, and um, and that was big for me in retreat. You know, because in retreat it's all about it's kind of about like dying. You know, it, it's it's. Breaking down that sense of self over and over and over and over and over and over. I don't, I'm not lying when I said I killed or I died. I didn't kill myself. I died a million times over in retreat. And it was painful. <laughs> Every time, probably. And I'm so grateful for it. You know, so when we were coming out, getting ready to come out of retreat, it's like, how do you come out of retreat? And you, and you don't exist, like you thought. You know, like who are you for the world? What are you? Like ah, you know, <laughs> it's like it's like being pushed out and being naked or something. You know, it's like wait a minute, what 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 what's, what's clothes I'm supposed to wear? It's it was it felt like that, and I really had to take that resurrection theme back and be like, okay, I broke this thing down so much. Who am I? Who am I for the world? Who do, who do they need? And that's what it came down to, is like, I walked over that line out of retreat 
totally naked, like to not not literally, but just like <laughs> I need to be clear about that. Um, <laughs> apparently, uh, <laughs> um, you know, but like being like, who who do you need? Meeting the faces on the other line, other side of that gate. Like, who do you need? Who are you? And who, who, what do you need? Who do you need me to be? I want to be that. That's all. You know. And um, hmm, it's a really beautiful place to be. You know, to just just want that. So then he says, the first Panchen Lama, he says, so next fix, your, fix yourself in the seven-pointed posture. And we all know that, right? You can watch your legs, make sure they're comfortable. And again, you're going to find what's comfortable for you. You might have to switch it up once in a while. Um, you know, the big thing in retreat was like, you got to do it in lotus, and you've got to really like <laughs> be in it for a long time. And I was like, OK, well, I'll try it, you know? I you try everything in retreat. And um, so I went into meditation in lotus, and it, it didn't hurt. It didn't kick me out of meditation, but I came out like three hours later, and I couldn't get out of it. It was, it was really funny. I'm like, oh, boy, like no one's around to help me. And I'm, I'm like stuck like this. I'm like, you know, could I walk to somebody's over to someone's cabin like this? I don't know. But literally, it was the strangest feeling to be like, it didn't hurt. I just couldn't get out. <laughs> and so, so, you know, I figured it probably wasn't the best posture for me. But, um, you know, so but you have to try, guess, it, it was crazy energy. It was really powerful to do it that way. But you can hurt your knees. My knees were more important to me at that time, and, and still are, you know. But, but if it works for you, that's great. Um, then he says, then clear away the mental chatter with the ninefold cycle of breath. Now, this is new. This is not normal, OK? He, he's saying, as a preliminary to meditation, do pranayama, basically, you know, and um, that's really far out, you know, and it just so happens I did exactly what he said. I did it for, for, for all three years. Um, I did this mindful breath, uh, so I want to share it with you. Okay, we'll do it, and then, where's my picture? Then we'll do a picture. <laughs> um, so I'll explain it to you, we'll do it, and then we'll take a break, I promise, okay? Um, this is my picture. Okay, so what this involves is, uh, just in case you, you aren't familiar with, with these particular teachings, um, it said that you, you've got this energy in your body. It's true. And uh, it flows through you like, like the breath flows in and out of you. Prana, you know, um, chi. Call it whatever you want. It's this um, life force within you. And it said that all of our misconceptions come because they're running down two side channels rather than the, the central channel. <coughs> okay? So you've got uh, this right channel. Um, yeah. And it, it starts like here, right around your nostril. It goes over the top of your head and down your back. Um, it runs about, it doesn't touch, so the central channel runs right in front of where uh, the spine runs, okay? So these side channels are uh, a little bigger and they're uh, not even an inch away, but they're not touching, okay? So it starts down here and it right kind of about four finger lengths below your navel, um, it hooks uh, I don't know if you guys can see that. Can you see that? No, maybe. Mm -hmm. So it hooks like a candy cane, you know, and then it, it meets, and that little point where the three meet, it's called a trivani, you know, and it meets at the, the chakra, there's the swadhisthana chakra. Uh, so the right one is called the pingala, and it's where all of your, they say, like your misperceptions of uh, ignorant dislike. 
says right it's all like that anger all that frustration all of those things run there in that channel and then the left one is a white one kind of like milky white opaque and again it runs on the um, left side of the body same thing up the side of the head down about four finger lengths uh, below your navel candy cane hooks there at the side of stana. and um, this one is said where it all your misperceptions of um, ignorant liking exist there. Um, so anytime you have, um, you know, craving for ice cream that you can't, <laughs> that you can't make go away, you know, it's because you have some wind running in that channel. You know, and if you're really frustrated at your partner or something, that's running in your right. So the cool thing about yoga is that a lot of what's going on in yoga is to move those winds out of the side channel into the central channel. If all of your, it's said that if all of your winds are running in the central channel, you'll no longer have any misconceptions. You know, we can live in that diamond realm of mind that His Holiness the First Panjim Lama was telling us about with, in the, just in the definition of Mahamudra. Okay, so, this is really powerful. Like even to share this with you guys, it's like a big deal. <laughs> so, um, my God, do it any time of the day when you're having any kind of mental affliction. You know, just if you're, so this is the way it begins. Um, they call it night point breath, because at a basic level, you do three, okay? So you do three, three, and then three. Um, you breathe in through the right, and you don't have to hold it like in normal pranayama. This time you just imagine it. You know, um, imagine breathing in, it goes up this right channel, all the way down, then it hooks like a candy cane, and then uh, you exhale, and it goes up. It goes up that left channel all the way out, and then up the opposite nostril, okay? So what it's clearing, it's clearing that left channel. You begin, <coughs> inhaling on the right, but then you're breathing out the left, and it's when you're breathing out that you're clearing. So those that first round of three, you're clearing all of that ignorant desire out. It's not a bad thing to desire, okay, it, at all, at all. I mean, we, we desire a goal, right? I desire to get to stillness. That's a great desire, but it can be a, a it can also be a mental affliction, you know, at some point. So, you know, it's just the point at, at which you, um, I mean, Keshala always says, you know, at the point at which you would hurt someone to get it. Uh, I think that's a good rule of thumb. <laughs> but, you know, it's the point at which it causes any kind of mental affliction, when it becomes any kind of obsession, when it dis disturbs your body any way at all. And in a retreat, you can get so subtle that it's like, oh, wow, you know, like that side channel's really blocked. What, what, what subtle thought is there? that I may be not even aware of, that I need to clear. So the first three, inhale through the right, exhale through the left. Then the next three breaths, inhale through the left, exhale through the right. And that's getting rid of all the ignorant dislike, okay? All of that anger, all of that frustration, all of that, um, all of those negative thoughts. Um, so three, three, and then the last round of three, you inhale through the two side channels, so both nostrils. Again, you're just imagining, right? You're not holding. So inhale through the two nostrils, down the two side channels, they hook like candy canes into that central channel, and then it just goes up and out. So the exhale is up that central channel, and then it goes out here between your eyebrows, okay? And you do that three times. And that's a big blessing for getting all the winds into the central channel. Um, again, anytime you're feeling off balance, use it. It'll help you get balanced, honestly. It's a beautiful, beautiful practice. I did it every time before meditation just to make sure my mind was in the right place um, so that I could hopefully have a good meditation, you know. Um, and I, I, I want to just say, like, probably, but because of the blessing of my lamas and, and His Holiness, the first Panchen Lama, like, in those three years, there was never a day I didn't want to get on my cushion. And 
And every day I knew that was a blessing. Every day I knew that karma could shift. <coughs> I knew it. I knew, I totally knew how fragile that was. You know, and, um, and I think this helped, so maybe. Um, so you got it? You got the picture? Does, does everybody, does this help? <laughs> okay, so remember, in through the right, out through the left for three. In through the left, and out through the right for three. And then in through both, out through the central for three. So when you're clearing out, um, when you're, the first three rounds are to clear out ignorant like, liking, the next three are for clearing out ignorant disliking, and the last is to get those into the central channel, yeah? Okay. So get into a comfortable seating position, meditation posture. <coughs> Any questions before we go? begin? We good? Okay. Most important thing is to have your back completely straight. The shoulders back and down, completely relaxed. No tension in your hands. No tension in your eyes. Remember, this first round is to clear out ignorant disliking. It'll go in through the right channel, which is red, and out through the left, which is white. So on your next inhale, inhale through that right nostril, over the top of the head, all the way down, hooks, and then breathe out that left channel all the way up and it exits that left nostril. Clearing out all your ignorant liking. Do it again. Twice more on your own. any craving that's been bugging you, all of it has been cleared out. You would keep going until it was all cleared out if you were on your own. We'll switch now to the other side. So on your next inhale, you're going to inhale through the left, up and all the way down, and it hooks, and then you exhale through the right. find all your ignorant dislikes, all your anger. Do it twice more on your own. dislike has been completely cleared. Your heart no longer holds anger, frustration. Now in the next one you inhale through the two nostrils all the way up. Left breath travels down. The two channels hook into that central channel and then breathe out that central channel. It comes out in that place between your eyebrows. And do it on your own twice more.
so when you do it through and out that central channel it's as if all the air has gone out of those side channels they collapsed and imagine just for a sec before you open your eyes that all the wind is just in that central channel and that you no longer have any mental afflictions that maybe finally for the first time you just feel peace what would that feel like? Offer that feeling to every being on the planet in the universe. the rays shoot out of your heart and just like give it, give it, give it away. Imagine the rays come back into your heart. So go ahead and take a break. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, and um, maybe just ten minutes. Yeah. Um, okay.